Coming up on Digital Music Trends 220, recorded on the 19th of February 2015, round two of our discussion around the document released by the U.S. Copyright Office, this time taking in the views of the Digital Media Association in Washington, D.C. We also cover DJs in low joining Apple, songwriters voicing their concerns in Sweden and elsewhere, Pandora's new artist audio messaging feature, Vessel's deal with Universal Music, and UMG's investment in Abbey Road Studios. Hello everyone and welcome to Digital Music Trends, I'm Andrea Linelli and this is the weekly show where we talk about and try to make sense of the latest news in the digital music industry and DMT is available on many channels, uh, pretty much any channel that will accept my RSS feed and many of these channels enable you to subscribe to the show but if you would like to download it then go and check out a podcast uh, app uh, for your phone, there are many available and uh, a lot of them are quite good and you can also receive a weekly mail out around the show on uh, digital on, on bit.ly slash DMT list again it's bit.ly slash dmt list and this week it's a real pleasure to establish the show with uh, lee knife executive director of the digital media association uh, also called uh, dima uh, known as dima uh, from washington dc so thanks lee for joining me how's it going Thank you very much for having me. It's going, uh, it's going very well. Thanks. It's great to have you. And uh, Dima represents the digital media industry with companies such as uh, Amazon, Apple, Microsoft, Pandora, and YouTube as members. And it's also a real pleasure to welcome Emmanuel Legrand back to the show. Uh, also, coincidentally, uh, now in Washington, D.C., where he is now writing as a U.S. correspondent of Music Week, amongst other things. So uh, thanks, Emmanuel, for joining me. How's it going? It's a pleasure to have you to see you again and to speak to you from Washington DC. I think it's the first time we're doing a show together uh, from DC. Yes, me from DC. That's great. So, and, and it's quite amusing to have Lee, who's probably a few miles away from where I am. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> exactly, and it's <laughs> on the show uh, also. And you guys both uh, 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 suffering from the the freezing temperatures that are that are uh, enveloping uh, that part of the world at this time. Uh, it's absolutely insane. Uh, looking at some of the, especially w- where I was on holiday last uh, October, minus. 30 or something it's it's uh, it's crazy and uh, yeah. the, uh, well so th- you know this week uh, we're gonna essentially continue uh, start by continuing the conversation that we started last week uh, uh, on the uh, copyright document that was released by the US Copyright Office around uh, uh, it was called uh, copyright and the music marketplace and so uh, very interesting conversation last week uh, and we had a uh, 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 you know guests that were perhaps more uh, prone to side with uh, with uh, uh, creative industries uh, and uh, uh, Lee it's great to have you on the show uh, today to uh, hear more of the uh, argument from uh, uh, Dima and and, uh, and uh, you, the, your thoughts as a representative of, of your members as well uh, and so let's start with uh, Lee perhaps let's jump in into the deep end and start with uh, uh, the statement that, that that you guys released uh, uh, a couple of days ago around around uh, the uh, copyright and music marketplace document and and uh, you characterize it as, as a missed opportunity so so can you start by elaborating a little bit on, on what you mean by that yeah uh, well what we meant by missed opportunity is that that the copyright office obviously given the broad mandate that they were given which was to look at the entire music licensing landscape and to come up with recommendations for how to modernize it um, we feel like they, they actually missed a lot of the, the potential areas where they could have made some significant advances. Um, and so that's, that's the nature of, of, uh, of our statement where we say they, they've missed an opportunity here. Um, they make a lot of good suggestions. I don't want to Im- imply that there's absolutely nothing there to work with. Um, but uh, the, the report on whole seems to focus very, very heavily, not even on rights owners necessarily or creators, but more heavily on rights aggregators, right? Those right. middlemen, those licensing middlemen like the PROs here in the United States and, and, and elsewhere in the world and music publishers. Uh, it doesn't do much for consumers. It doesn't do very much for the digital services that I represent that, that supply those consumers. Um, and it doesn't do much for creators all the way down the line either. Do you think that might be because uh, those middlemen have created such headaches uh, from a regulatory perspective in, over the last uh, couple of years? Uh, yeah, I mean, obviously, it's it's a response to that. Uh, uh, you know, it, it's also, uh, quite frankly, it's a little bit of the makeup of the Copyright Office itself, right? The Copyright Office is staffed by a lot of uh, um, ex, you know, music publisher 
uh, type people, and, and they view themselves, uh, rightly or wrongly, as kind of the protectors of copyright. Um, and copyright here in the United States, again, as elsewhere in the world, tends to reside largely with these large aggregators. Right. Right. And so, uh, if you if you view yourself as being in the role of protecting copyright, uh, I, I guess it's a natural kind of reflex to go first to protect those aggregators of those copyrights. Absolutely. Uh, Emmanuel, for, for, uh, from your point of view, you know, what were your broad uh, takeouts from this and uh, uh, where do you side on how the uh, Copyright Office handled the release of this report? Well, I'll just reply first to Lee. Absolutely, yeah. Uh, uh, in the sense that, yes, well, they are heavily geared towards the, you know, the rights owners, but because they are called the Copyright Office, that's also the reason why they're doing it. Uh, they are also the custodians of, you know, the concept of copyright and the way it's rolled out in the country. So that's that's also their that's their raison d'être. Otherwise, they will be called differently. So I think it is not a surprise that actually takes the side, or slightly, you know, in in, in, a, in some some of the ways of the the, the, the copyright community, uh, because that's also that's part of their job. Uh, what I what I would say overall about the I found that it, it was an extremely interesting report, 245 pages, uh, with lots to read and lots to take on board. Uh, I'm slightly uh, worried that actually there might be too much in it, in the sense that uh, they are proposing a wide range of changes, especially in the licensing process and in and in creating streamlining the 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 the, the, the process. There's some very interesting uh, infographics at the bottom end of the the report that actually show what could happen if you know the system goes the way the copyright office wants. But that's that's so far down the line that I think it is an ideal situation that they have tried to depict in the report. I have absolutely no <laughs> no guarantee or nobody has any guarantee that actually that's going to be the end result because there's so much that can happen in the process. Yeah. And one of the interesting parts that we discussed uh, last week was the emphasis on trying to rebalance uh, uh, the, the skewed balance that there is at the moment between the, the uh, owners of copyrights from, from the master side and the publishing side. And uh, uh, we've seen that uh, as a, a bit of a theme uh, around the world over the last few months. We've seen a lot of songwriters complain uh, around the uh, uh, revenues that they're getting from digital services. Uh, I guess the, the big question mark uh, for the guys that you represent, Lee, as well, is, uh, you know, everybody's talking about raising the rates for uh, 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 that is going to be received by publishers uh, and songwriters. But the question mark is where is, is the percentage that is being taken going to come from? Is it going to come from from the, mm -hmm. the pie of, of the of the uh, master owners of, of the labels or is it going to come from the pile of the services that are, are uh, uh, distributing the music? And, and so on, on that front, how do you feel about this debate? Obviously, you know, the, the report from CISAC that said that 3%, only 3% of revenues go back to songwriters highlights that the, the revenues are low for them. Uh, but on the other side, you know, the, the pie is already distributed. So how do you redistribute that? Um, well, uh, you know, the, the question, and, and uh, 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 Emmanuel will, will uh, uh, note this personally because we've had a discussion about this just recently over the, uh, 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 through email. Um, the DEMA company's position on this is largely agnostic. Well, in, in terms of the split, you know, whatever revenue we pay out, for the access to musical works, you know, in their final form as yeah. a as a sound recording, which also embodies the the underlying composition, um, uh, we're largely agnostic to the way that gets split up. I mean, obviously there there is infighting on the creator side, yeah. right, between the record companies and the RIAA and the music publishers and the NMPA as to what is the value of each of their inputs to, to the total product. Yeah. Um, on, on a large scale, uh, digital music services really don't care. Uh, as long as, as you pointed out, Andrea, the entire royalty obligation in aggregate isn't so large that it, it creates an unsustainable business environment. Yeah. So uh, while we may be or may not be sympathetic to a particular songwriter's plight or a particular sound recording uh, artist, artist's uh, you know, position in this, uh, the bottom line is, uh, and this gets back to what I was saying uh, earlier about the missed opportunity for the Copyright Office, and it goes to a little bit of what Emmanuel was saying, we understand that the Copyright Office is main function is the protectors of copyright. Um, but uh, the reason we talk about this as a missed opportunity is because 
to not view copyright as a part of an entire ecosystem yeah. um, and to view it simply as, the, as kind of this isolated right that needs to be protected regardless of what happens in terms of its its you know financial capability or its or its functionality in the greater in the greater you know kind of community is uh, again it's a missed opportunity it's kind of putting blinders on and saying well we're just going to protect copyright regardless of what the realities are surrounding it and so that's that's kind of the viewpoint uh, getting back to the, your original question here that's kind of the viewpoint of of uh, DEMA members is that what we have to do is we have to create a sustainable economic. Uh, environment where everybody gets, you know, everybody can survive and everybody can flourish. Yeah. Whether that means songwriters get m more than they get now or they get 30% or they get 50%, um, we really don't have a view on that because we're not creators. Yeah. We just want to make sure that there's a sustainable ecosystem here. Uh, yeah, but uh, it is, sorry, my, my mic is falling. Uh, wait. <coughs> there, there was a story in Billboard two, week, two days ago about relating to the Pandora versus BMI uh, legal case. And basically what it says is it, that Pandora had accepted terms with Sony ATV and Universal Music Publishing that were based on pro rata of 10% of Pandora's revenues. And when BMG came knocking on the door, they said, well, actually, no, it's going to be more or less the same rate as BMI, which is 1.75% one, 1. or something like that, or 1.85%. So the, 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 the platforms themselves, like Pandora, uh, are ready to pay a bit more to certain people within the, uh, the ecosystem and a bit less to the same family of people but different companies. So there is, you know, within the platforms themselves, there is that kind of already uh, the acknowledgement that not everybody is going to be paid the same way, but, and you're, they're ready to pay more people that have, you know, more power, more repertoire, more capital. So it is, you know, the, 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 a company like Pandora acknowledges the situation and is paying different rates to different people. So it is possible also to mod to, to have uh, different points of uh, different rates to diff according to different people. The question is now, you know, can you up, you know, the percentage that actually goes back to songwriters and publishers? And I guess you bring up uh, two really good points there. And, and the first one that I guess is probably more relevant to the document itself was uh, uh, how do you set the the rates? And so the the document talks about. Uh, the migration of all the rate setting to the uh, cop copyright royalty board. So essentially that would take uh, the burden away from the courts uh, as it is at the moment. We're seeing all these uh, different uh, rate setting tribunals uh, ongoing uh, and, and it, would, it would move it into, into one uh, specific body that is uh, perhaps more equipped, uh, as the document says, uh, to handle this because they have more expertise in the field and they have people that, that work specifically in this area. So, uh, uh, Lee, you know, t going back to the idea that uh, a lot of people that work uh, around copyright have uh, are previous uh, rights owners uh, or, or have been working in, in that environment. Uh, how do you feel about that proposal of moving all rates setting to the copyright royalty board? Well, uh, it, it, it obviously, you know, on that one, the devil is in the details. Right. Um, uh, one of the problems that DEMA members face, uh, we've, we've you know, participated in several different rate setting proceedings uh, in front of the Copyright Royalty Board, both for the mechanical royalty rate, which is Section 115 here in the United States, and also for the sound recording in uh, uh, non-interactive, which is Section 114 yeah. of the Copyright Act here in the United States. And, uh, you know, the, the Copyright Royalty Board, we'll see what happens now. Right now, we're under, a, uh, we're involved in a current rate setting proceeding for Section 114 in front of a new panel of three judges. Right. Um, these three judges haven't rendered a, a decision yet, uh, for us at least. Um, and so it's, this is an interesting proceeding because uh, we're going to see what these judges want to do here. And at least initial indicators are that they're being a little bit more active um, and, uh, and a little bit more circumspect in their, in their running this proceeding than the, than the last three panel judge, uh, the, the last three judge panel was. Yeah. Um, so, uh, you know, the problem as we sit here right now, I, I think that the federal judges using federal rules of, of procedure under the PRO rate setting uh, cases have done a better job overall uh, than the CRB has done historically. 
But uh, again, when I said uh, earlier that the devil is in the details, I, I, we don't necessarily assume that the CRB can't do their job properly yeah. when they're given you know, the right parameters in which to behave um, and they're given all the evidence. That's really the problem with the CRB as we see it now, or the, or the bigger problem with the CRB is the way I should say it, is that uh, the procedures, the rules that, that govern the procedure in front of the CRB yeah. are actually so archaic that it's uh, virtually impossible for them to adjudicate appropriately. Yeah, yeah. And, and talking about uh, those sanctions uh, that you mentioned earlier, uh, the, the document also talks about the fact that at the moment uh, the, there isn't a great deal of, of uh, detail as to how the uh, provision of uh, uh, services are, are differentiated. So the document, for example, talks about uh, a service that provides a, a curated experience uh, uh, whereby it's, it's non-interactive in the sense that you can't uh, uh, choose the tracks, but it does create the playlist for you uh, to, to create a difference between that and, and a service that doesn't do that essentially and just streams uh, essentially a selection of tracks. Uh, it, 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 do you think that's something that, that might concern some of the some of the companies that uh, that you represent? Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, it, essentially, what the report does is it looks at uh, at the Launchcast decision, which was a long coming, very very hard fought decision, which <clears throat> you know everybody in the space has agreed to kind of stand still on, right? Even the RIAA in their comments uh, said that while they disagree with, the, with that decision, uh, they really don't see any reason to, to mess around with it. Um, and the Copyright Office report essentially takes that decision and says, well, we disagree with this decision. And we think there are different levels of interactivity um, that ought to be respected and that the LaunchCast decision kind of uh, paints that with too broad of a brush. Yeah. Yeah, Emmanuel. On that side, do you have any comments? Um, it's 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 a uh, you know for a, a, a non non lawyer, you know, getting into the one, <laughs> you know, section one fifteen, one fourteen, and the shenanigans of that is uh, you know you know gave me a headache when I was trying to. But I, I what, what I what what uh, it's always shocking. I think. Uh, Especially in the, the the country of, you know, the free market, that actually the rates are set by a tribunal or a set of judges, uh, by structures that have nothing to do with the business itself. So maybe it's you know at some point it is better when you need some kind of ruler because the the, the stakeholders themselves are not capable of agreeing on something but in this case the main the main issue is that actually you don't uh, you don't see the the the, the market at, w at work and the market deciding what the what the good rates are because you're always dependent on judges or tribunal or something to actually do it so it is it is a, it is a very peculiar system which is inherited from you know 50 years ago 60 years ago and it you know goes even deeper because you know a lot of it goes back to 1940 1941 uh, so it is it, it's an interesting situation where you you know it's one of the most advanced countries when it comes to new technology if not the most advanced country, you have a lot of, uh, and, and the, the whole copyright environment, you know, it's probably from the Middle Ages or something like that. So it is, you know, it, that's where there's a lot of work to do. I am not, I am not convinced that the solution is is a tribunal, uh, because it can work, you know, in other parts of the world, it works without without being like that. So why should it, couldn't it work like that in the U.S.? Yeah, and, and it, that's interesting actually because uh, I think part of, um, uh, in some circumstances, which I, I can't remember right now because I read the document a week ago, but uh, the document does talk about the fact that some of the rates uh, would be essentially allowed to be set by the, the free market, the willing buyer, willing, uh, willing seller uh, 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 sort of philosophy, but that if they can't come to an agreement, then that's when the, the rates uh, that are established will actually kick in. Uh, it, it, does that sound about, about right or did I totally misunderstand the document? I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we're, we're probably all misunderstanding the, the document, but uh, I, I think... Yes, uh, that's true. <clears throat> it, which is, you know, right whatever, <laughs> that's, that's no slight on any of us. Um, <laughs> But I, I do think you've you've essentially got it correct. I, I, I think what what the what it says, at least with regard to uh, some of the statutory rate setting, um, obviously the report goes uh, out of its way to continuously say what they want to do is they want to move towards a free market system, um, and they want to give music publishers th these opt out rights, um, and they also want to make the CRB kind of only become 
uh, activated when it has to be activated. The idea is that uh, as settlements would occur, uh, theoretically, that the CRB wouldn't, n wouldn't need to be uh, invoked. And so having a statutory provision that says the CRB will, uh, you know, be convened every five years to set these rates could be dispensed with, and they could only be called up when rates couldn't be agreed to in a free market. Yeah. Yeah, that, that, that kind of seems like it makes sense. And one of the things actually we talked with Greg, about with Greg Barnes uh, last year when we when we spoke, uh, he's a uh, lead counselor at, uh, at DEMA, uh, when we spoke at Southwest Southwest, uh, was uh, uh, the fact uh, that, and it's, it's a bit of a leap from what we're talking about now, but uh, uh, on the positive side, uh, the fact that we were uh, sort of uh, sad, saddened by the fact that the, uh, the GRD was uh, sort of not coming off the ground. And a few months later, we uh, we all uh, uh, realized or uh, came to understand that uh, the project had halted uh, uh, granted to, to halt. Um, uh, one of the things that is interesting about the document is that uh, it talks about this sort of overarching uh, body that would essentially, uh, in, in, to a certain degree, glue together all the performance organizations and stuff uh, called the GMRO. And this would also, like the main responsibility from what it sounds like uh, of this GMRO would be the creation of just such a database, uh, really, uh, that uh, uh, would contain a lot of the copyright information that is required in order to license the works and and, and everything. So uh, is that a positive and is that is that achievable in the current environment, do you think? You're asking me, you're asking Emmanuel? Either or, one. <laughs> um, uh, I, I, I'll, I'll take the, the, the first shot at it. Um, obviously, I thought, it I thought is, you were going to say I, th I take the First Amendment. <laughs> yeah, right, right, no, right, right. I take the, I, I plead the Fifth. Um, <clears throat> uh, that, would be, that would be wonderful for Andrea if I did that throughout this entire session. Um, there would be. You know, uh, I, 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 again, this, this comes, uh, this is also one of the things that we were referring to when we talk about this as largely a missed opportunity. Um, you know, as an ideal, obviously, that, that's great. Uh, the idea of having some master uh, repository um, of the data that relates to all the musical works and sound recordings that are available and then also can function as a, as a kind of a licensing hub. That's absolutely a wonderful idea. But uh, when you look at the report, it falls really short on exactly how that would happen. And indeed, in, in some respects, it's, it's, uh, it, it kind of, again, slights the, the digital music services. Um, essentially, it says that, that services that use the GMRO, in other words, licensees, would fund the GMRO uh, yeah. by virtue of, of, a, of an additional uh, kind of uh, fee that they would have to pay that would be set by the CRB. And it justifies this by saying that the rights aggregators, that the PROs and the, the others that would make up the MROs, um, their contribution would be their data. Um, it does nothing to talk about, well, what happens when they give bad data? It, does not, it doesn't even <laughs> make accommodation for, well, what happens when a digital music service actually builds this database better than any of the MROs can do, yeah. right? Because I would imagine quite, that, quite a few of your members will have extensive databases at this point with a lot of this information. Okay. Of course, and in, and indeed, if you know current indicators and recent indicators are are uh, are to be trusted, they have better data. Um, they have more complete data. They have better data, and it's more accessible. Yeah. Um, and so, I, I mean, what happens there if uh, you know if one of my member companies creates a uh, you know the the however you want to say it the quintessential database that could be used by the GMRO? Um, should they get paid by rights owners? For having developed that, I, uh, I, I might argue yes. But you know, there's a bigger thing there, which is that the Copyright Office disavows any obligation to uh, to help create this, or to administer it, or to make sure that it's functioning properly. Um, and they do so, I, I, as I recall, I think they summarily kind of dismiss that obligation by saying, "Well, it wouldn't make sense to have the Copyright Office do this because w we don't have uh, we don't have the, the the resources to do it, and it doesn't make sense." To to make us start from scratch. Right. And then a few pages later it says this GMRO will be established <laughs> and will be and will ingest all of this data from all of these other sources. So basically what they're saying is well we don't want to start from scratch here but we think it should be started from scratch somewhere else. Right. Um, uh, you know it's just uh, it's it again it's a, it's an ideal it's it's a wonderful concept. 
Uh, obviously, as we, you know, you talked about with the GRD, um, there have been multiple attempts to get rights holders to give up their information and submit it to one of these kinds of centralized databases. And thus far, all of those attempts have failed. Yeah. I'm not necessarily sure that a voluntary system to do that here in the United States is going to fare any better. Uh, Emmanuel, from a, from a European perspective, like how would you feel about a database that does essentially something similar to what the GRD was supposed to do, but is US-based and is, is controlled by the Copyright Office, essentially? Well, if it's US-based, it might not have all the repertoire from the world. That's one of the problems. So yeah. it probably will not be a global repertoire database. Uh, I agree with Lee when he says that probably his members have a much better set of data than rights holders. And we saw it again, if I refer again to that article in Billboard, that Pandora was able to withdraw a certain number of tracks that were 100% published by BMG, which means that they probably have a few algorithms that allow that to happen. We, we saw that YouTube has the capacity to block videos on you know in certain territories and and so on so they have very good databases so uh then the question is you know how you put them together and how you actually have the most accurate one the grd started well but uh could not figure out the you know i think the financing was one of the key issues since the rights holders i.e the publishers wanted it to be financed by the 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 right societies by the PROs, uh, and that's it's the PROs, and especially in North America, that you know basically uh, killed the project. When when ASCA, BMI, and SOCAN in Canada decided that they were not going to put a penny into the project, it killed the project. Uh, so that is interesting because it came from North America, uh, when actually the demand was more from outside of North America. So I think we're very far, 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 far away from having something that will look like a global repertoire database. Yeah, and that's that. Uh, Lee, anything else that we needed to touch on that we haven't touched on uh, right now that you, that you uh, wanted to chat about? Uh, no, uh, n nothing in specific, I guess, just right. as, as a general you know, idea. Uh, I, again, we find this as a missed opportunity because there was, there was an opportunity here to look at the entire landscape of copyright, not just as it relates to the creation of copyrighted works and the protection of them, but the whole ecosystem uh, that involves the creation of, of those works, the marketing of them, the promotion of them, and the distribution of them uh, ultimately to the consumer public and that's what we see as a missed opportunity is is that kind of holistic view of of how does music licensing work um, from from beginning to end uh, as opposed to well how, how how is life difficult for these middlemen aggregators of copyrights yeah yeah and so I guess Lee, Lee, uh, sorry Andrea Lee do yeah, you sure. think that there is another uh, way to access that uh, the, 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 that kind of uh, global view is through the, the 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 white paper and the green paper of the USPTO. I, I certainly think all of these things, you know, should be folded into it. And and again, you know, what we're what we're hoping for is a holistic view of the entire music landscape that takes into account uh, each of the players in it. Uh, again, from the creator to you know their uh, rights aggregator and their licensing body and music services and consumers. Um, yeah, I think I think the 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 USPTO and 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 several other agencies that are looking at this. Um, they all have good questions. Uh, I think part of the problem is that, uh, at least with regard to those uh, and, and what ostensibly this report was supposed to do, this report was supposed to look at the entire landscape. Right. And uh, again, in our view, it fails to do that. Um, and some of the other things that are that are going on with USTI and, and stuff uh, specifically don't, right? They, they denounce the idea that they're looking at the entire landscape. They're looking at individual issues and individual problems and and trying to address them. And, and finally, I, I wanted to ask you guys, because I, I know very little about it, I don't know if you, I, I don't know, if you know any, any more than me, but uh, about feasibility. So we're looking at this uh, huge document, a lot of things in it, a lot of things that are going to be very controversial, and I'm, I'm going to uh, you know, see lobbying from both sides of, of the spectrum uh, to, 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 to get to sort of a compromise on, on what the position is going to be in the final, in the, in the final bill. Uh, you know, if this doesn't come to the fore in the next two years, I was under the impression that the copyright, at least the, the register of copyright position, w was a political ap appointment or, or, or not. And, and what would happen if there's a change of administration in two years and this hasn't yet been, been implemented? Would it just 
fall off the face of the earth or would it still be uh, you know usable for 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 a bill in the future well i think i should as the as the local us uh, yeah, exactly. lawyer i should probably feel that <laughs> help us. so uh, uh uh there there's a bunch there that, that you asked um yeah. and all of it good by the way so so the first thing is yes it's a very very voluminous report um and as uh, emmanuel uh stated it it, it really is uh it, it, there's an awful lot there, and indeed, there's so much there that it's it's probably not achievable. Certainly not achievable, uh, you know, whole cloth as it as it is. There may be portions of it that are achievable or attainable uh, on, on the short term and stuff. Um, so, what's going to happen with the report? Uh, obviously, it's been submitted to Congress, and Congress now has to look at it. Um, the, the the big issue is going to be whether or not any of the parties involved, right? Whether the record companies and the RIAA, the music publishers and the NMPA. The the performing rights organizations, the songwriter uh, uh, organizations, DEMA and our members, et cetera, the consumer interest groups, whether any of them are going to agree on any of these recommendations or how to implement them. Because ultimately what Congress has to do is forge a compromise amongst all of those parties. Um, that is going to be a very, very uh, difficult task. As it relates to Maria Palante's position, you're correct that it's a political appointment, but it, uh, it it's one of those unique political appointments here in the United States that does not suffer from the vagaries of of uh, uh, you know party changes at the right. presidential or the executive level. Because she's only um, the twelfth, so I guess it couldn't have it couldn't have been a, a change with each administration. Right, that's what I was going to say. I believe that Maria Palante is only in the double digits of of registers of copyright, so they they tend to sit for way longer periods of time than the individual executive um, administration that appoints them. Uh, I, I, I don't Isn't that due to the fact that actually the person who appoints the register of copyright is the Librarian of Congress, and nobody can remove the Librarian of Congress, if, my, if, if, if I understand well. Therefore, it's a position that, that, is, that is, it's a political position, but at the same time, it is not a political appointment in the sense that it is not, uh, it's not, it's not a, uh, either the Congress or the White House that actually appoints the Register of Copyrights. Well, I mean, you're touching on a larger issue, right, which is what, what is the nature of the whole uh, Library of Congress? And, and this was something that was brought up in one of the 114 rate-setting proceedings a few years ago about whether or not the CRB is an appropriately appointed uh, judicial body because they act like a, a, a federal uh, judiciary body, which has to be uh, those bodies under the United States Con Constitution. Judges have to be appointed by the executive with advice and consent of Congress. Congress. Um, and what happens with the CRB is the CRB basically exists inside the, the Library of Congress. Um, and so they are neither appointed by the executive nor do they suffer the uh, advice and consent of Congress. But I think that, that uh, there may be too much being made of that. While, while that's an argument that's close to my heart, um, I, I think that there may be too much uh, being made of that. I think the Librarian of the Librarian of Congress can be removed. It just doesn't happen very often. Um, and indeed, the Register of Copyrights can be removed, but it also doesn't happen very often. Um, and so to, to get back to the original point that uh, Andrea was asking about, I don't think that this report, whether it's received well or not, or whether much of it or any of it or all of it is, is actually implemented by Congress over the next two years or the next four years, um, really will make a difference to Maria Palante's uh, uh, tenure as the Register of Copyrights. Um, but there's one other point that I wanted to make about that, which is just so that we, you know, if, if we're going to learn from history here, the last time the United States updated our Copyright Act was back in the late 60s and ultimately came into effect in the early 70s. That was a 10-year process. Um, uh, it, it literally went on underneath the aegis of Register of Copyrights for just about nine and a half, ten years. Uh, it was started in, I think, the mid-60s and, and wasn't complete, completed until uh, the early or mid-70s. The 76, um, so, I think. Yeah, so, so this, is a, this is a process that historically takes a very, very long time, and we are just at the front edge of it um, as, as we're talking about this very first music, uh, this music licensing report that the Copyright Office has just issued.
That was great. Well, thanks, Lee, so much for your time. And uh, once again, uh, please go and visit uh, uh, digmedia.org, digmedia.org, for more information on the Digital Media Association and all the latest news. The final thought on the on the it's not a thought actually. It's it's more the way it's been uh, received. Well, you, you've seen that Dima was not very happy because they thought that actually it was a missed opportunity. Uh, and there's probably some some reasons to that, uh, but they will they will find other points of entries through Congress, through the USPTO, which also is another body that is you know dealing extensively with copyright issues, yeah. um, and through the courts because Pandora, you know, let's not forget that Pandora is in court, you know, against you know in a, in a, in a battle uh, over rates with BMI. Uh, but what is interesting is that the the record companies via the RAA uh, were you know said there was a lot to digest, which was a way to say, mm, I'm not so sure, uh, we're very happy with what is in there. Uh, whereas the, the publishers basically got a lot of what they were expecting for, especially the opt-out. Yeah. And uh, it's, they're pretty happy on, you know, that side of the table is pretty happy with the, with the report. So as Lee said, and, you know, the real problem now, the real issue will be to find a consensus to reconcile because copyright is usually a bipartisan uh, issue in the in the US it's not divided by the rules of you know democrats on one side and republicans it's more on the 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 the, the dividing line is more on the side of the pro um, the pro copyright community uh, the pro creative industries and the pro tech yeah. So, and and nothing imp- exemplifies that best than California, where you have the representative at the House from the south of California, which mostly represents Hollywood, but the, the representative from the north of California, which you know San Francisco and Silicon Valley, it, you know represents you know the tech, and you know just put those two people in the same room and try and find a consensus on copyright issues is extremely difficult. Yeah. So, in a nutshell, this is the problem that Congress will have in the next three, five, ten years before Absolutely. they find a consensus. Absolutely, and, and just as a, as a uh, postscriptum on, 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 on this uh, piece that lasted uh, 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 the best part of 40 minutes, you know, I, I, I thought it was interesting, to, it was important to uh, bring both sides of the equation in, because obviously if, you, if uh, the listeners that are tuned in uh, today uh, have listened to last week's show, they, they will know that we were extremely positive about the whole thing, so, you know, obviously it was good to bring in both the perspective of somebody that thought that overall this was a very good uh, report and the, the perspective of somebody that uh, didn't think it was quite as good. And, uh, uh, you know, with DMT's audience being uh, almost 60% US, US-based, I thought it was also important to uh, highlight this, even if it did take a, quite a, quite a, a uh, you know, a, a chunk chunk out of the show uh, this week as well. And uh, I, there's a few things that we need to talk about, though, that are, that are quite big that happened this week too. Uh, so, Emmanuel, you're going to stick with us and 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 uh, power through them. And uh, uh, the first one is an interesting development over in the UK where we've seen that Zane Lowe, one of the UK's most successful uh, radio DJs uh, uh, who worked at uh, BBC One, uh, uh, Radio One, for uh, over 12 years, has uh, announced his uh, leaving uh, the BBC to join Apple. So uh, the move was entirely unexpected and, and uh, it's, it's not quite clear yet what uh, Lowe is going to be doing uh, over there but he apparently is going uh, to move to LA as part of the, 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 the process and uh, essentially from the interview that he gave to The Guardian it sounds like he is looking forward to having a more gro- global influence on, on what's going on uh, and, and curating music uh, to a, a more global audience than the national audience that he generally gets uh, uh, here in the UK. So, uh, uh, very exciting stuff. Uh, you know, we've seen a lot of different commentaries around this uh, as to whether this is Apple's strategy, whether they're going to do more of this uh, type of hiring, uh, you know, how that compares to Spotify's strategy. So, Emmanuel, on, on your front, how, how do you see this move? And uh, do you see this being a, a win for uh, an upcoming uh, Apple Beats uh, service? Well, it's a declaration of intent, I would say. Uh, the, the thing is that we don't know uh, what's going to happen because Apple hasn't made any of its plans uh, public. Yeah. Uh, we know they bought Beats. Uh, we know that uh, Jimmy Iovine from Interscope, formerly from Interscope, who uh, well, is one of the co-founders of Beats, uh, now works with ADQ at Apple. And uh, the word from the Grammys uh, 10 days ago was that you know everybody was there to pay their dues to Jimmy and Eddie. So it was like a <laughs> the duet was performing, and because everybody is expecting 
the, 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 the new streaming service from Apple to be launched sometime, you know, in the, the second quarter of this year. Yep. Um, so they're, they're, set, they're putting together deals with record companies, with music publishers, etc. Uh, in case you haven't noticed, they're cleaning up also iTunes, and that pisses off quite a few independents because they've, they've, they got rid of quite a lot of catalogs over there uh, and duplicates and things like that. So they're preparing for that. So having uh, someone who is, you know, largely identified as a, as a, as a trendsetter in music, uh, going to LA, doing curation, I think goes back to the ethos of beats, because if you remember well, uh, Trent Reznor was the was involved from the start, uh, you know, as the chief curator at, at Beats. So uh, I, I think from that perspective, maybe they are, you know, following the initial, uh, the initial strategy that Beats had by being uh, heavy on on editorial cu- and and on curation. Yeah, I don't know. That's you know, otherwise they wouldn't be doing it. No, exactly. It makes sense. Uh, you know, uh, Beats. Uh, the whole ethos of Beats uh, was to focus on human curation, and uh, uh, obviously that that's different from the approach that some other companies have taken, which is more of a, of a uh, combined uh, uh, approach of, of human and mechanical, with mechanical perhaps taking a bit more, picking up a bit more of the work than, than human curation. Uh, and so, yeah, it's going to be very interesting to see what happens there. And obviously, we don't know anything about uh, the, the, the future developments of, of Apple, but... Uh, uh, I guess it was uh, after doing the show year in and year out for so many years. I guess it was an exciting challenge to go and do something else for uh, Zayn Law as well, and to and to uh, uh, find a new challenge in that. Uh, and uh, uh, one of the other things that happened this week uh, was an interesting, and I, I mentioned it very briefly uh, earlier in the show, uh, is uh, uh, that. Uh, uh, Essentially, the this uh, song, song, 133 Swedish songwriters, uh, uh, which include uh, several who penned uh, uh, big international hits as well, have pulled together and, and have signed an open letter headline. It's time to thank you for the music, uh, uh, which uh, coincided with uh, with meetings that were scheduled between uh, the Swedish Collection Society, uh, SCAP, SKAP, uh, Spotify, and the labels. And so the songwriters uh, point out that essentially they don't believe that uh, they, they enough money is flowing back to songwriters. Uh, they're asking for more transparency from from the uh, 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 collective organizations uh, to uh, uh, you know perhaps uh, 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 refuse to sign um, more confidentiality agreements and actually uh, be able to show to to uh, the songwriters how much uh, they are getting from uh, from each service uh, um, and uh, this kind of goes to uh, tie in with uh, uh, the uh, report uh, the the initiative uh, the day the music died uh, by Basca the British Academy of Songwriters uh, uh, who also are, are calling for uh, uh, songwriters to receive a better share of digital royalties so this is an interesting debate that is coming to the fore now even more uh, prominently it is something that I had spotted you know a couple of years ago you could already tell that the way that the deals were structured uh, the publishers was going to get uh, you know proverbially uh, screwed essentially uh, so uh, you know what what. Uh, you know how has that debate evolved, and how can it evolve in the future to to uh, help songwriters make more money out of, out of digital services? Well, you, you could also add the fair trade music movement that you know was launched in Nashville a few months ago. Uh, you can you know th- there's uh, a lot of initiatives at the moment. Uh, there's a, a huge sense of frustration, I think, from the songwriter side, uh, probably less. You know, probably also by the publishers, but slightly less. Uh, but the songwriters have really that feeling that, first of all, they're insulted when people tell them, you know, you should go and you know uh, sell T-shirts to make a living. <laughs> well, actually, you know, they're writing songs and they're not performers. You know, and people say, well, let's go and play. You know, you should go and play them live. No, actually, it's not my job. My job is to make songs, <laughs> not to perform them. So they always fear feel that they have the wrong end of the deals. Uh, I think the, being mobilized is one step to actually get better deals, uh, it, but I think it, it, the, the overall situation, and it goes back to the initial point that you were making, is how is if you get extra money for songwriters, is that money going to come from the overall pot that goes to rights, music rights holders, and mostly from the recorded music side, yeah. or is it something that the services will pay on top in addition to? And I think that's the, that's going to be one of the key debates. Uh, by the way, incidentally, uh, it is one of the debates that we are organizing at Canadian Music Week on May the 9th in Toronto, if you happen to be there. Great. Uh, I'll be happy to, uh, <laughs> to see you over there. But it is 
one of the, the, the main issues at the moment. Uh, CISAC, the International Confederation of Author Society, released their collection reports. Uh, the figures are from 2013, but you can imagine, you know, it's probably not going to be too different 2014 and 15. Is that digital only represents 5%, 5% of the overall collections of author societies yeah. around the world, all repertoires combined. Uh, the reason is not in the volume. The volume is huge. It's just that the, the remuneration per, uh, per hit is so low that actually it does not scale up. Yeah. And that is the key issue for the next five years is how, since you know, physical is going down and downloads is go are going down, how can you make up? You know, if, you know, th th there's no, not enough scale and also if the rates are so low. And that is going to be one of the key issues within the music industry in the next three to five years. Yeah, yeah absolutely. And uh, uh, we've had some uh, other interesting news, actually. There was a lot of movement uh, uh, just yesterday, really, from uh, the Recode uh, conference uh, that uh, was taking place uh, over, over in the States. Uh, they have some, had some fantastic guests from the uh, sort of music industry side and they had a, a long the conversation with uh, Pandora's uh, founder Tim Westergren and uh, uh, with uh, Universal Music Group uh, as uh, CEO uh, as well as uh, the CEO of uh, Vessel, the new video service. So mm -hmm. le let's uh, let's pick it up one by one uh, and sort of break down the news. Uh, first of all, uh, Pandora uh, has uh, announced uh, uh, the a new feature that they're experimenting with that would allow artists to record messages and send them to their fans via the internet radio service. So these would be uh, audio messages. Uh, uh, the feature is called artist audio messaging and would enable them to essentially uh, send out uh, any news that they might have or announce tours or, or or even you know send a joke out you know uh, anything really from the artist uh, i'm not quite sure how it's going to be implemented it, it wasn't really elaborated on uh, whether it's going to be part of the actual pandora service and, and you know uh, um, in, inserted between songs if if uh, somebody is listening to a particular artist a particular artist's radio uh, and then they're going to insert those messages within that uh, so i'm not sure how the distribution side of it is going to work exactly but it seems to align uh, pretty well with the uh, Pandora AMP initiative where they're also trying to give artists more data and more power around what they can do with the Pandora platform and and, and sort of in my uh, very cynical uh, point of view I was I was trying to figure out you know how much of that was uh, uh, due to the, the genuine want wanting to help the artist and on the other side how much of that was was uh, due to the fact that they don't want to see the, the, the rates that they have to pay uh, uh, raised and so you know they can show that they can provide uh, artists with an added value service like that, uh, can that you know lead to a, a stabilization or even a decrease in, in the rates that they're paying to the industry? So uh, a lot of interesting stuff there. What are your thoughts around the new Pandora initiative and, and, and how they're behaving in this field? Because they're both really good projects. So you know, excited to see them. Uh, obviously, I'm not sure where they lead. Well, there's, there, there's two there's two things. One is uh, Pandora as a platform, and the other one is Pandora as uh, a, a partner in the ecosystem. Uh, Pandora as a platform is a great product. Let's remember that it is a non-interactive uh, digital service, like a radio uh, through the internet, with multiple uh, points of entry and all that, but no interactivity like in Spotify, where you actually you do create your own playlist, you, you choose your songs, etc. So whatever they can add uh, to make the experience uh, better for the, the consumer is great. And if they provide new tools for artists, it's also great because uh, it has an impact. Pandora has an impact impact on you know what people listen to and uh, you know it, it's it's a great tool then there's the the other aspect which is you know the behavior of pandora as an organization and its top management uh, and and basically uh, you know I, I i could sum up you know the, the the way that you know it's been perceived by a lot of people in the creative industry it's, you know just pointing the finger saying well actually you know <laughs> f you <laughs> and we're doing whatever we want and they've been constantly constantly challenging whatever rates they're paying whatever you know and not really uh, making uh, people in the industry feel that actually they were part of the same industry. So there's a gesture on one side, which is to say we are, we're providing those great tools to artists, and then you know the same week they're fighting BMI in court for uh, you know 0.5 percent or something like that of their revenues. You know, which is you know fair enough because they're a business. But the same, it's it's. Uh, I think there's a little bit of Je Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde in, in Pandora at the moment, and I don't know who is who at the moment. Uh, it looks like a Marvel Comics character, 
you know, that can, you know, morph into, you know, at m one time it's a nice person and, you know, some of the time, you know, they're, they're showing their teeth and they're, they're, they're the bad guys. <laughs> you know, I, I don't know. The verdict is open on that one. But uh, I am excited to see how this is going to be implemented. So I, I will follow up with any reports on people that are actually encountering these messages on the service if they surface, because apparently artists like Lenny Kravitz uh, are already uh, working with this. And uh, next, uh, again, from the re uh, conference put up uh, by Recode. Uh, I was going to be very nasty and say, who cares about Lenny Kravitz these days? But I know, it know. was, I, I, yeah, it was kind of strange because he's popping up all, all over the place. He, he's, he has, he's had the slot of the Super Bowl and now this. So it's kind of great, you know. Uh, Interesting, uh, and so uh, and and then we want to talk about. And he hasn't aged. I don't know what happened. I don't know what they do to these people. They never age. Uh, and uh, let's talk about Vessel. So uh, Vessel uh, is a new video service that uh, you know essentially uh, counts on people uh, wanting to see uh, be the first to uh, see a certain video. It's focusing on on shorter uh, videos, and so uh, rights holders will, will would give Vessel essentially the exclusive for a certain number of hour, uh, hours, a minimum of seventy two hours, or, or for a few days, and then. Uh, it will go on to wider distribution on channels like YouTube, for example. And Vessel has struck a deal with Universal Music Group for uh, the exclusive access to some of the record labels videos so it doesn't say all it might be restricted as to uh, which artists actually participate so uh, I'm not sure if we're going to see the biggest artists or not uh, taking part in this but essentially uh, you know Universal Music uh, shows an interest in, 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 in trying out the service here and seeing how it works and see if it drives more subscribers and, and higher revenues as part of also uh, UMG's plan to uh, try and widen the base of, of types of subscription services that can be uh, out there uh, and not just the Spotify's and, and the artists of this world. Uh, uh, it, for me it's, it's quite an interesting project I, I'm not sure given that the breadth of the stuff that that is on Vessel, uh, how many people are going to want to pay those three dollars a month for the for the access? Uh, uh, Emmanuel, from from your end, uh, how do you see this deal shaping up, and uh, do you think Universal is smart in jumping on uh, early on? Well, there's different things. The first thing that came to mind was uh, how about Vivo, uh, yeah. in which Universal is also a shareholder. Uh, why isn't Vivo doing that? Or and you know how must Vivo feel with Universal making that kind of deal with Vessel? So I, that, that's, that for me is a question mark. The, the other thing is, yes, it's always difficult to get people to pay for something, but you know, three dollars two ninety nine is not necessarily uh, huge. Yeah. Uh, but then, if you do that, you have to super serve your audience, as they say here. And to super serve your audience, you have to have exclusive stuff. Yeah. And that's where deals like the one with Universal come into play. But if you start, you know, then you will have. You know, maybe Vivo will have a, a premium, uh, a freemium and a premium v window, and then YouTube might create also something like that. Then there's going to be a lot of uh, competition for for consumers' attention and for their dollars. Yeah. Uh, YouTube has shown that you know there's a lot of channels on YouTube, and you can subscribe to a certain number of them if you get ex uh, you know exclusive content, and uh, it is not a, a completely uh, out of base uh, model. I, I think you, it on, it comes down to the fact, you know, what can you provide to the consumer that is actually special, and that you know, if you have a forty-eight hour window of exclusivity on certain videos or on something, you know, that's probably you know, super fans will probably be happy to pay three dollars a month for that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And uh, um, um, I guess uh, you know. Uh, uh, I guess you know if if you find a, if you look at a video like you know Anaconda by Nicki Minaj or or something by by uh, Miley Cyrus, you can you can imagine people that know that it's out there and cannot access it and want to see it. There might be a, a, some people that might want to pay for 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 for, for being able to access that. And so three dollars a month for if they manage to have like one video or two three videos a month that people really want to watch and and they might be willing to pay for you know is actually a you know reasonable uh, enough price and people won't mind too much paying that. It's just a guess. Yes, but but uh, these days, how long can you keep something exclusive? Yeah. Because I mean, <laughs> people, people, people are gonna people are gonna rip it's it out in the yeah. open on YouTube, you know. Yeah. So essentially, it's gonna be a case of them. Uh, 
you know, having a very aggressive uh, takedown policy on YouTube because I guess as soon as the video is out on Vessel, it's going to be ripped somehow and it's going to end up on YouTube. And, and so they're going to have to play catch up on, yeah. on the takedowns as as it happens with it happens a lot uh, in, in this season as well, because uh, with all the award ceremonies and the Grammy ceremonies and stuff, uh, you keep seeing videos pop up of the of the ceremony that are, is perhaps not being distributed in the UK and you can watch a performance and then an hour later that that video is gone. But there's another video that's just been uploaded with the same performance. And so it's definitely a, a bit of a whack-a-mole uh, type of approach uh, on, on that front and uh, one of the exciting things that I, that I, that I heard uh, sticking with uh, talking about UMG is that they decided to overhaul Abbey Road Studios in London very very exciting I used to work just around the corner from there for uh, three years um, and uh, uh, you know you see uh, tourists uh, risking their life, uh, lives on a, on a daily basis uh, trying to recreate the famous uh, uh, Beatles cover and uh, and so Universal I did that. <laughs> <laughs> been there done that <laughs> and so Universal is uh, you know uh, decided to uh, uh, interestingly is uh, start a multi-million uh, refurbishment of the entire uh, complex uh, this is I mean for me it's fantastic news because you know uh, it means that this piece of musical heritage of the UK is not going to shut down anytime soon uh, given that many of the studios in London have already shut down that's that's definitely a relief and on the other hand it kind of makes good business sense right because it, it feels like if they can refurbish it to a standard where big artists are going to want to go and record there they are already on Universal's label they're going to save money in the long run well uh, yeah I, 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 uh, you cannot just restrict it to say just it's going to be Universal well since they're well, the yeah, biggest course, record company yeah. most likely they're going to be the biggest client uh I don't know if you've ever been to a B road. Uh, outside, it doesn't look impressive. No, no, it's just a house. It in, looks like a big house. If you walk into the studios uh, and you say, "Well, this is where John, Paul, George, and Ringo, and you know George Martin sat and recorded, you know, some fantastic music," plus all the, 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 the it is the, the place has a special spirit. There is something in there. The acoustic also is fantastic. I was told. Uh, by the you know a few years ago by by the people you know at, at, you know it was owned by EMI that every time they were uh, refurbishing a studio they were making notes of absolutely every single little piece of wood on <laughs> you know to replace it absolutely identical so that you know the the acoustics is not is not damaged so whatever you know investment Universal is going to put in there is fantastic it's great news uh, but also uh, it's it is one of the very few studios in the world that can fit a philharmonic orchestra. Yeah, and you can also there's a I mean, lot. The, the of problem is that that work is, is dry, drying up, so there's less and less of that kind of work that can go in it. Yes, but there's soundtracks, and a lot of yeah. soundtracks are recorded in a B road. And my understanding, see, I've, I've seen the press release like you, is that they're going to install that new uh, 128 tracks or 256 track surround system, blah blah blah, which is perfect for for movies. Uh, you know, if they, they they always had the best technology, but they also had the, the oldest and best technology, and that's why uh, artists love it so much because they find vintage 1950s microphones yeah. that have a special feel that have a special sound it's a great place the, you know they they um, they, <laughs> they had a few uh, they organized a few years ago uh, events at the studios and they had to stop because people were stealing <laughs> bits and pieces you know anything that belonged yeah. to a B road so that they could say back home this comes from a B road <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> <So> <laughs> <laughs> now they're restricting it only to people who actually go there for work and not people who just go there for visiting I'm not surprised but I mean it's interesting there because uh, you know as you said I, th I think what they're trying to do here is to be able to start bringing artists that are not interested in that retro sound. I, mean, I guess, you know, a, a lot of the artists that are interested in that, obviously, they, they would think of Abbey Road as a place to go. But uh, the artists that are making more modern music, more synth-based mid music would, would never today, I don't think at least, go to Abbey Road to record. I guess what Universal is hoping that with the refurbishment, more artists that are on its more pop roster uh, might choo choose that studio over others uh, uh, in, in the making of the album. So it's going to be interesting to see how that affects what they put in them and, and how, how that evolves, really. But also, you know, you can take Abbey Road as a, and they've started doing it as a, uh, as an overall brand for where well, you can have live uh, sessions, yeah. uh, either for radio, uh, Radio Two, and I think and Radio One have done quite a few. There's also been a, a series of BBC uh, showcases uh, at Abbey Road and and all that. So that's it's a great way to keep you know the studio alive. Yeah. The problem is the impre impredictability of 
you know the 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 bookings of the rooms you you know that there's there's guys who are going to be going there for a month well i don't know if you can still afford that these days <laughs> uh, but, <laughs> uh, but you know big uh big recording sessions for 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 soundtrack electronic music is a different animal altogether so you know and sometimes also electronic music does use uh you know old instruments like drums or you know horns or yeah and so that might be also a way to merge different music styles yeah and uh yeah i mean it's it's such an amazing place and uh, uh i i uh, once uh, i was lucky enough to see see uh, sit next to uh, george martin uh, at uh, in the most bizarre place it was like a audio engineering conference or something uh, uh, a, f- a few years ago and uh, it's such awe of hearing him uh, talk about uh, uh, abbey road as well and uh, uh, so next i wanted to uh, talk about about uh, uh, the UK album ch- albums chart. This is a story that we haven't covered yet last week because uh, I think it came out the same day or the next day after we recorded the show. So uh, the official charts company has announced the biggest shakeup of the UK albums charts yet. Uh, and uh, uh, there's going to be an, an interesting uh, uh, review of how uh, the album charts is, is organized. And uh, essentially, uh, we're going to see the official charts uh, uh, incorporate streaming data into the album charts, uh, but in a different way than it's done in the US. So in the US, uh, uh, how, how it works is that X number of track streams equal X number of sales, uh, even if we're talking about an album. So if you have a, a, a runaway single that is a number one for weeks and weeks and weeks uh, and sells uh, loads, of, uh, you know, uh, streams uh, millions and millions of, 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 of times, uh, uh, that will actually push the album up uh, the chart. Whilst in the UK, uh, they decided to essentially uh, create a... Create a um, uh, downweighed uh, method uh, you know they, they decided to uh, make sure that the mm. two biggest tracks I think of the album uh, were downweighed so that they didn't skew the balance of the album uh, uh, according to a certain uh, uh, formula that uh, uh, is, is on the website and I'm sure uh, the audience mm. can go and check out if they want but essentially uh, you know uh, the, the the rationale is the same is that you know a thousand uh, 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 you know hundred twenty thousand sales of uh, uh, sorry streams for example uh, would result in hundred twenty additional sales but uh, some of the streams will be cut back to uh, take into account the biggest singles so uh, do you think this uh, you know this seems like a really a great approach and I think it's been praised uh, uh, throughout the industry for for what they've done uh, how do you feel about this integration. Uh, I, I, for first of all, it had to happen. Uh, then you know the question is how. Uh, in the U.S., I think the ratio is a, a thousand streams equals one one track or something right. like yeah. that. Uh, and it's been quite criticized for actually doing what you just explained uh, and having a more subtle approach. You cannot just take you know if there's 10 tracks on an album and you can assume that all 10 tracks are going to be uh, streamed the same way but so having a more balanced uh, way like the, the the Brits are doing it seems like the good way forward yeah uh, we'll see let's see how it, it affects uh, you know the charts in the in the in the near future uh, you know there, there was the case of that you know there's, there's uh, albums like uh, Robin Thicke's uh, Blurred Lines yeah. was a huge hit but the album did not sell so uh, how would that fare with the streaming system in the US the album probably would have gotten a little boost whereas in the UK uh, it might not change much and it's probably a better reflection of the of the situation yeah. but then there's the overall discussion uh which you know is 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 part of the the, the times is you know is the album still relevant you know yeah. <laughs> and uh and so old farts like me who you know grew up you know with vinyl and then cd uh still see it as a as a relevant piece uh, to judge, you know, the, the the creativity and the talent of of an artist, uh, it seems that you know the new generations are more geared towards tracks. Yeah. Uh, and as opposed to what was thought initially, initially, uh, success goes to success. Uh, the you know when you like a track and it's a hit and you share it with your friends on Facebook or you know elsewhere. You suddenly you create a, a bigger hit, and I think what we've seen is the, you know it's more and more mega hits, yeah. and less and less in between. 
and and I think that's also the problem with the with the album is that the album is is a is a product from another era where and I'm not so sure that actually the the, the teenagers today relate to that as a as, as a tool they don't care they right. what matters to them is the song that they like they, you know the fact that there might be twelve other songs uh, you know they're not really exploring that yeah yeah it's it's gonna be an interesting thing to see and I think you know uh, uh, as you mentioned uh, I, I it might not have a huge impact at the, at the beginning because uh, I, I was I was doing some maths and essentially for an artist it's a similar ratio to what's uh, planned in the US uh, uh, but for the fact that uh, uh, there's that downwing that I mentioned earlier uh, uh, that is applied uh, so for an artist that gets a million hits for example uh, they would that will count for around a thousand uh, uh, extra sales counted uh, on the album's chart which could make a difference but it, it couldn't make a huge difference uh, considering that you know somebody like Ed Sheeran for example clocked uh, about 200 million streams in the UK uh, or, uh, with his album X over the, uh, X, uh, over the last year uh, and so you know you, you, you're looking at this and thinking well 200 million streams or, over a year on a week by week basis that wouldn't have made a huge difference to, to, to the total uh, 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 chart position unless it was only by you know two or three thousand copies the difference which is uh, uh, it doesn't happen all that often so so yeah we're gonna see what happens but obviously as uh, streaming uh, picks up uh, steam uh, that difference is gonna become more noticeable at, also as album sales continue to drop so uh, unfortunately uh, no uh, news there and uh, f- you know I think uh, we should probably wrap it up because we, we've uh, gone well over an hour but uh, uh, I just wanted to finish uh, by mentioning that uh, uh, the South by Southwest the 2015 hackathon has been announced it will take place uh, uh, on uh, the 18th of March uh, in Austin for 24 hours uh, unfortunately I'm not covering South by Southwest this year uh, <laughs> so yeah uh, neither of us is, is going down there but uh, it's going to be lots of fun I think for the people that are going to be there go and check it out if you are planning to go to Austin and uh, uh, the second one was that there was a, a rumor uh, another rumor of a, a, a big machine acquisition this time by Snapchat or even Snapchat in collaboration with uh, uh, Apple for some uh, unknown reason uh, so this is a rumor from the New York Post uh, that uh, uh, saw essentially the, the companies uh, talk together with uh, with Cobra Keta at the, uh, the, in, during the Grammys week uh, you know we don't know what's going on there and uh, we'll keep you posted but uh, it seems uh, kind of interesting that we're seeing uh, potentially uh, more technology companies interested in the purchase of a label than uh, perhaps uh, as it was traditionally a bigger label that just wanted to in, in, you know integrate that label within their own roster so uh, <laughs> interesting times there and uh, uh, that's pretty much it but uh, Emmanuel anything that you wanted to uh, talk us through uh, as far as you're concerned or uh, anything that you've written that uh, people should go and check out um, no I think it's been a very uh, busy start of the year uh, with lots of stories, as you mentioned, and and a lot a lot of very interesting things, you know, sh- shaping up. You know, we'll we'll see how the uh, you know the Apple launch will be crucial and very important for the for for everyone, in, including for Apple. Yeah. Uh, and the, the, you know, I'm really looking forward to to the next few months because there's going to be a lot to to write about and to report on. And and it's you know being in the U.S. is also quite exciting because Absolutely. you know it's uh, they're driving a lot of the the changes. And I, and I hope that it gets warmer soon. Otherwise, you're going to be stuck inside for a while. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's t- always tequila to keep you warm. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and, uh, if you want to follow Emmanuel, uh, his handle on Twitter is at Legrand Network, and you can uh, check him out there. Uh, well, thanks so much for uh, joining me, Emmanuel, today. And thanks to Thank Lee you. as well uh, for joining us in the first half of the show. And thanks so much for listening. I really hope you enjoyed it. Uh, you can find more on digitalmusictrends.com uh, and uh, subscribe if you uh, are a first-time listener. Have a fantastic week. And until next time.